Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. As you can see, I have been blessed to get another of God's chosen sons on the air. I have today with me Father Timothy Gallagher, and he is a prolific author. Author, excuse me. I think seven books is a prolific author. Um, first of all, Father Gallagher, welcome. Second of all, is it more than seven books yet, or is that where you are? Uh, it's a good many more than seven at this oh, point. Goodness. How many? Uh, 20 something. I haven't counted them. I must have been reading incorrectly because I was reading about your newest book um, earlier. And I anyway, so welcome to the Breakfast with Bacon show. I was excited to find out that you wrote a book called Discernment of Spirits in Marriage, because as you know, that is my uh, happy place. That is the right. vocation God gave me. And so I just want to start out by um, asking you, I think it's the obvious question, why marriage? You know, as a priest, you're counseling couples daily, weekly, I suppose. But so that may sound like a silly question, but why this book? Well, let's say for uh, three reasons. One is that I grew up in a family so um, and continue to um, have a large family around me. So that's one thing. Um, Second thing is, as you just said, uh, Christine, I've been working with married couples for 43 years of my priesthood now. And the third thing is that the experience this book describes is universal. There is no follower of the Lord who does not experience what Ignatius describes in these 14 rules for daily discernment. So that it is, um, I, I'd say, not at all out of place or even difficult to apply them to marriage because everybody experiences them. You know, I've been uh, writing and teaching about these for close to 40 years now in every setting, place, um, kind of group you can imagine. And uh, to date, not one person has ever said to me, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm. Every, every, everyone does. This Ignatius isn't adding anything to a spiritual experience and let's say to a marriage in our specific application what he is doing is helping us, for most of us, I'll include myself, for the first time to understand what's always been happening, which is life-changing. Because once you realize, you know how they say you're condemned to repeat what you do not know. Well, once right. you know it, uh, you're free now to make different choices. And that can really be uh, literally life-changing. Yeah, and you're talking about Ignatius because I forgot to read the tagline, which is Ignatian Wisdom for husbands and wives. So um, can I start by asking you a, a simple question? When we say discerning the spirits, are there certain spirits? Are there like seven of them or six or a, a, a plethora of spirits? And then my second follow-on question will be, yeah, how do we discern them once we're able to number them or name them? Or Sure. Well, there are essentially three actors in every person's spiritual life. There is the individual, him or herself, obviously. And then there is what Ignatius calls the good spirit. Now that means above all, God himself, the Holy Spirit who works in the hearts of his children. But it also means those other influences that are from God and directed toward God. So this would mean all of the good angels about whom we don't think enough right. uh, in the spiritual life. It also means the richness and profusion of grace poured into us through baptism so the indwelling of the Trinity, sanctifying grace, the different virtues that are given to us, the gifts of the Spirit, and so forth. And then finally, that would also include all of those good influences around us in the world, people, places, books, homilies, whatever it might be, the which if we open ourselves to them will lead us to God. So that's the good Spirit, which uh, means God and all of those influences which are from God and directed toward God. And then the third actor is the one Ignatius calls the enemy. It's his most common word, and so I'll use it as well. It's a good word. It's the one who is the enemy of or inimical to living our life the way God intended, uh, living it according to the truth of our humanity. So Satan. So that, that would mean in the first place, obviously, Satan and his associated fallen angels. It would also mean the wound left in us as a legacy of original sin, which we call concupiscence. And then finally, the any harmful influences around us in the world, the which, if we open ourselves to them, will lead us away from God. It's just the classic triad, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So uh, these are the three actors in the spiritual life. 
Now, how do we recognize whether it's the good spirit um, inspiring thoughts and feelings or whether it's the enemy inspiring thoughts or feelings? Well, that's what Ignatius equips us to do in these rules. And he gives us uh, a simple, very clear, very usable set of criteria for discerning that. To get into that more specifically, we'd have to start getting into the 14 rules themselves. Is it too much to ask you to get into one of those rules? Because I am work with married couples, right? And so one of the things when I got my PhD, Father, was to... Um, I always felt like true intellectual scholars, PhDs, always talked about all this lofty, lofty intellectual stuff, but they never knew how to apply it to my life. And I was like, I'm so over your theory. How's that going to make me have a happier marriage? So one of the things I do, it's my skill set, is I take that lofty intellectual knowledge and I always joke that I bring it down to the blonde level, right? So I can look at a couple and say, here's how you can apply this to your marriage so that you and your husband or you and your wife will stop fighting so that you two will have improvement in your overall marriage or in this specific area. So when you talk about these 14 rules, is that, are they theoretical or are they easily applicable to the situations you see with the couples that come to you? Sure. Their setting is in Ignatius' book of spiritual exercises, and the title itself tells you that this is, there's nothing abstract or speculative about this. This is about the doing, the exercising, the living of the spiritual okay. life. Yeah. It's a short text. <clears throat> excuse me. In the original, it's 1,231 words, which is about three and a half double space pages. So it's a very short, compact text. And what Ignatius does is in the first four rules, he lays down the fundamentals that we need in order to apply this teaching. And then in the last 10, he gives us tool after tool after tool to apply the teaching in daily life. So uh, I'm very much with you, Christine, in the way that you write. All of my writing is on that, on that level. Let's take this and make this concrete, understandable, and usable, which is what I try to do in the book that uh, we're discussing now. Well, to give one example, so I'm just going to uh, jump been at rule five, which is the famous rule in which Ignatius says uh, in these eight classic words, in time of desolation, never make a change. Now to fill that out, because everything in this set of rules is on the spiritual level, what Ignatius is saying is when you are experiencing spiritual desolation, so as you live your life of faith, let's say today prayer is dry, right. God feels far away, you don't really have energy to take those new steps in your marriage, we'll say, that um, have felt so life-giving recently and that have given you joy, but now all the energy is gone. Uh, it's one of these downtimes in the spiritual life. And this is what I say. No one has ever yet said to me, you know, I don't know what Ignatius is talking about. We all do. Okay, when you're in that situation, Ignatius says, don't ever change anything that you had planned in your spiritual life before the desolation began. So, for example... Here is a woman who has it on her calendar to go to confession at 4 p.m. on the next coming, upcoming Saturday. And then we'll say uh, earlier in the week, a tense conversation with her teenage daughter that doesn't really resolve too well. And uh, it, it's an ongoing tension that's kind of discouraging. And we'll say she's a part-time teacher uh, in the morning. And she works with students with disabilities in the local high school, let's say. And uh, this morning, um, one of the students was completely out of control. It was just a really discouraging experience. And this has been in her heart the last couple of days, and she's not responding perfectly to it. Uh, some of her prayer has slipped. It's been hard to feel energy for prayer when, you know, her heart has these things going on. And now it's Saturday morning, and she remembers that at 4 p.m. she planned to go to confession, and she finds herself thinking, I don't know, you know, feeling the way I feel, maybe it isn't the best time for me to make a confession that'll be really helpful. Maybe I should uh, just reschedule that for next Saturday. Okay, so two questions. One, is she in a time of spiritual desolation? She, she is, certainly. And is she in a time of spiritual desolation thinking of changing a spiritual plan she had in place before the desolation began? Yes. Again, yes. And whenever the answer to those two questions is yes, Ignatius Rule 5 tells her, don't make the change. Go to confession today exactly as you had planned at four o'clock because the enemy will try to get us to change those proposals, obviously, because if she does go to confession, 
very likely that'll be the end of the desolation, yeah. which of course the enemy doesn't want. So th this is Ignatius classic rule five. And, and uh, you know, I can't tell you how many bad decisions I have not made in my life because of Ignatius rule five. So this is just one of them. And I think that already uh, answers the question, are these practical? You couldn't get more practical than Ignatius it is does. in this set of rules. Yeah. This is not a marriage question, but I'm going to ask you because what kept coming to my head when you were saying that was a specific situation that I had with a woman whose um, son was killed in Afghanistan. And it was the first couple days she was in that daze and I was walking, you know, I took her to the store to buy some shoes and clothing for the funeral. And uh, she was a military spouse, so she knew she was going to get a large sum of money. And one of the things, because people, you know, talk about, you know, what are you going to do with that? And I said to her, do not, do not make any big decisions for the first six months. Do not, just don't. You're not even going to be capable of making those are coming out of this funk. Even though that's not a marital discernment it seems to me that it applies in the same way right that because your mind isn't going to be focused on the the purity of thought and union with with christ as it should be am i on or am i off no you're absolutely on and what that says is that this principle which ignatius enunciates on the spiritual level because this is discernment of spirits <laughs> so everything right. in his 14 rules addresses the level of well, if you want to use the uh, the terms nature and grace, okay, just what's natural to our humanity and what is supernatural or this specifically spiritual life, everything Ignatius is doing is on the spiritual level, but there are absolute parallels on the natural level. Um, and that's what you've just described. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, let's say a woman is uh, battling with depression and wisely she's getting help and counseling. And one day she comes to her counselor and says, you know what? I think I'm going to quit my job and move. Okay, now we're on the natural level here. Uh, but the counselor is probably going to say something like this. You know, this might not be the best time for you to make choices like that. Why don't we get through the depression and then we can look again at that? So, yes, this principle applies both on the natural level and the spiritual level as well. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So what do you mind going through some of the other rules? Because sure. I know you All right, I'll, I'll just enunciate them and then... Uh, we can dive in wherever you wherever okay. you'd like. So in the first of the rules, Ignatius starts as um, with the person very far from God. So this is the person who is living far from God and a life of pretty confirmed serious sin. And he asks, how will the good spirit and the enemy work in a person in this unhappy situation? Think of Augustine before his conversion, for example. He was in my head. It's exactly okay. what or, I was thinking Or Ignatius of. until the age of 30, very much there. Uh, but this is obviously very real uh, today as well. So when a person is in that situation, Ignatius says, the enemy will fill the imagination with images of sensual pleasures. Because as long as the imagination is filled with those images, the person is likely to continue to live in that way. Now think of um, the internet today and phones and tablets. Pornography and, and all how, how real all of that is. And in these same persons, God never stops working. Um, in these same persons, God will always be at work. And uh, actually, in the book we're discussing, I call this God's loving assault on the heart. The good spirit, Ignatius says, will sting and bite in their consciences. So let's say uh, here's a man who's uh, 41 years old, hasn't been to church since he left home 20 years ago, uh, not always faithful to his wife, willing to engage in seriously dishonest business practices. Last night, he and his wife had a huge, huge fight over some trivial um, domestic issue. And both of them knew that it wasn't the issue itself. It's what the damage that he's been doing to their marriage and family. And let's put him on a highway driving home from work. And um, by God's grace, the radio is off and the phone is off. And he's alone with the thoughts in his heart, which uh, very readily go back to that very ugly scene the, the evening before. And he finds himself thinking, why are you doing this to your marriage? Why have you caused your wife so much suffering? What kind of a parent are you? What are your, your children going to see and think of you when they get old enough to realize what's going on? Are you proud of yourself when you see yourself cheat a client? Okay, it stings. It bites. Yeah. It's troubling. God's loving assault on the 
heart. And we can see that if this man is willing to accept the stinging and biting action of the good spirit, he's only a hair's breadth away from returning to God's. The thought will come, I can't live like this. You know what? I'm going to call my pastor and ask if we can talk. And that can be the, the, the change, you know, pivotal change in his life. So that's the first rule. In the second rule, Ignatius now addresses the person, and this is very likely going to be, I, if I may say this reverently, most, maybe all of those listening to us, the person whose life is going in the other direction. So yes, the just one falls seven times a day. We're all weak, and we all need God's forgiveness, but people who sincerely don't want sin and really do want to love and serve the Lord. Okay, how will the enemy and the good spirit work in this person? So now Ignatius is speaking very directly to all of us. Uh, the enemy now is, is going to try to hinder this, and the good spirit is going to try to help this. How will the enemy hinder this? Well, Ignatius names four tactics of the enemy, and we, you, you know, uh, we could go into depth in these. In the book, I exemplify these for Mark and Anne, uh, just basically to try to discourage us. You know, when if you hear this voice, when you're trying to let go of something that's not good for you spiritually or uh, take some new step, let's say in prayer or living your vocation, which will be a blessing spiritually, and you hear this voice which says, uh, yeah, make your efforts, um, but you know nothing's really going to change. How many times have you tried to do this? How long has mm -hmm. it ever lasted? What makes you think it's going to be any different this time? You know yourself. You're never going to be much of a wife or husband or father or mother. Mediocre at best. Don't get. Don't think you can ever really change. So I, I say that very reverently. But we've all heard that voice. Yeah. Now it can be very different when. What if we believe that voice? Then we won't take those new steps. But if we can do what Ignatius invites us to do and be aware of what's going on here, identify that as the discouraging lie of the enemy that it is, and firmly reject it then we will go forward. On the other hand, the good spirit will be encouraging in all kinds of ways, um, giving uh, consolation and inspirations. So the man driving home in the car, you know what? I got to speak to my pastor. There's the action of the good spirit, giving inspirations to one who would very, very initially, but is trying to move toward God. So uh, something a friend says, something that's said in a homily, a uh, podcast like this that you listen to in all kinds of creative ways the good spirit will encourage that rules three and four ignatius describes the two basic spiritual movements and that is spiritual consolation when our hearts are joyful in the lord we feel his closeness there's energy for spiritual things and then spiritual desolation which is the opposite when we get discouraged and disheartened and you know i would say in this after many years of dealing with this I think for most dedicated people, which I'm going to, again, if I can say it reverently, probably includes everybody listening. Uh, the real obstacle in the spiritual life is spiritual desolation. When we get discouraged and disheartened, and there's a lot of it around today. Yeah. And so a teaching that helps us to be aware of it, name it for the discouraging lie of the enemy that it is, and firmly reject it is one of the greatest gifts, I believe, that God gave to the church through Ignatius of Loyola. All right, then the last 10 rules, ways to reject spiritual desolation. Don't make changes when you're in desolation, rule five. Rule six, four spiritual means to apply to help you resist the desolation. Rule seven, certain ways of thinking that will strengthen you in desolation. Rule eight, call to mind that this desolation is going to pass and consolation is going to come back a lot sooner than desolation wants you to believe. Rule nine, three reasons why a God who loves us permits us to go through spiritual desolation. Because in each case, if we resist it well, beautiful fruits come into our spiritual life. Rule 10, prepare for desolation even before it comes. And then in the last three rules, Ignatius highlights three qualities of the way the enemy works in his temptations, which is the other basic tactic of the enemy that we all experience. Temptation, that is deceptive suggestions. Why don't you let your prayer go till later? You can let yourself see that doesn't have to get too far out of hand. And then spiritual desolation, which is heaviness of heart in the spiritual life. So in his temptations, it is easiest to resist them right at their very beginning before they snowball. Rule 12. Rule 13. Well, I'll add something here. Rule 13. When you're struggling in your spiritual life, don't be alone with it. Find a wise and competent spiritual person and talk about it. 
what I'll add here is that if a person puts into practice rules 5 and 13, rule 5, don't make changes in the darkness of desolation. Rule 13, don't be alone with the heaviness. Find a wise and competent spiritual person and talk about it. If you do those two things, you're going to get safely through any spiritual darkness you may ever experience in your life. And then rule 14, there is for all of us a point where we are most vulnerable to the enemy's discouraging lies. Identify it, strengthen it. So that in a, in a, that's probably about as quickly as I've ever gone through the 14. Probably. Rules. But that's, uh, that's just to enunciate their titles, really. Well, thank you for those 14 rules, Father. But as you and I talked before we went on the air, everybody watching this is going to say, okay, that's great. And and especially the devout Catholics who probably are familiar with St. Ignatius. But again, some woman, some man might be watching this and saying, tell me how that's going to help my marriage right now. My husband's having an affair or my wife's an alcoholic. Um, we haven't prayed together in a bazillion years or ever. Can, can you take one of those rules and apply it to this this ma imaginary marriage and maybe even something that you've had in your office without naming Sure. Me? Okay, well, then I'll just use the two characters that you have in the book, Mark and Anne. And um, when we first see them, so we'll start with the first two rules. Uh, when we first see them, they are sitting together out at a park. They have been dating for uh, some time. And they both know that marriage is in the air, although they haven't formally been engaged yet. And at a certain point, as they, they sit on this park bench, uh, Mark finally wants to share something with Anne that he, because they are thinking of marriage, um, he wants her to know about himself. And she's been basically a pretty faithful Catholic uh, all her life. She has her struggles, but she's been a faithful Catholic. But Mark now lets her know that... Um, he got into a wrong crowd when he was in college and it got to some pretty bad places. So he was living pretty far from God. He's an optometrist uh, in the, uh, in the story. And at this point he's telling her about his years in graduate school, studying for uh, to become an optometrist and a friend of his named Jim, who uh, is a pretty bad influence for him. But at this point they're really close uh, and they do an awful lot of things together. And he says to Anne, I, I want to tell you about the first time that I saw you. And she answers, well, I know the first time you saw me. No, I saw you once before then. And of course, she's very interested to know what he wants to share. And things had really spiraled downward spiritually in his life, very successful in his studies and now uh, beginning to, to serve as an optometrist, all of that going very well. But spiritually, morally, his life is completely out of control at this point. And on this particular Saturday, he gets a, a call from Jim who tells him there's going to be a party uh, this night, Saturday night. And um, he's uh, inviting uh, Mark to go with him to this. And Mark knows what this party really means. This is about, uh, it'll be about as bad as it gets. The kind of things where, the kind of party where really, really bad things happen. And now he's alone uh, in his apartment uh, as it's getting toward early evening, struggling with what he's going to do about this. Uh, is he going to go or or is he not? And part of him uh, says it will be great. You know, um, everything will be permitted. Uh, and so there's an energy in him that wants to go toward this. But at the same time, there's another uh, movement in his heart that he's done everything he can to get rid of, but he can't. And it's there. Um, what are you doing to yourself? Why are you doing this? You know you're not happy living this way. How long are you going to keep this up? Now, you can see what I'm illustrating there is the action of the enemy and the good spirit and a person far from God. The enemy inciting him forward on his path through the imagination of everything that will be permitted. And the good spirit stinging and biting. Now, the way the story goes, uh, he agonizes over this and finally realizes that he can't do this. And desperate, not knowing what to do, he decides to do something he hasn't done in years, and that is he's going to go to Mass next Sunday morning. And he does. And he's embarrassed to even be there, he comes in late, sits at the very back of the church. But something said in the homily speaks to his heart. Uh, let's say the gospel is Zacchaeus, you know, this man who is far from living his faith and wants to see Jesus. And of course, all that happens 
And the homily uh, touches his heart. And then as he's uh, looking forward from the, the rear of the church, he notices this young woman who is at Mass, who apparently is praying uh, very much from the heart and, and really living the Mass. And he's struck by this. Of course, at this point, Anne knows that he's speaking of her. And he said, I made two decisions at that point. One is that um, I want I would speak with the priest after the Mass and ask if we could talk. And the second was that I wanted to meet you. And then you know, things go on from there. But he wants her to know, you know, where he's been. And, um, well, do you still want me, you know, knowing where I've been? Um, yes, Mark, that was real. But where you are now is real, too. And I've known you for the last couple of years. And that's real, too. So they go forward with the marriage. And now we'll move into rule two. So Mark uh, does return to the church. Well, he's already started since he's known Anne. But uh, this begins to grow now in his life. He's faithful to Sunday Mass. Um, there's a men's prayer breakfast in his parish, and he gets interested in meeting other men who want to live this way and starts going to that, enjoys the contact with the other men, some friendships develop there. And he notices that uh, some of these men stay for Mass afterwards. He's never even ever thought of this idea of going to Mass during the week. But he gets interested and begins to do it. And as the months go by, it begins to get more frequent. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a homily one Sunday in which the priest invites the people to spend 10 minutes every morning reading and praying a bit with the readings from the daily Mass, maybe with the Magnificat monthly booklet or uh, some digital service. Yeah. And he starts doing this. And he loves what's happening in his life. And now this is the profile of the of the person of the second rule at this point. Um, he and his wife are drawing closer together, and um, the, the marriage is getting stronger. He has more peace in his life. And then one day uh, he gets an email from Jim. Um, Mark, haven't seen you in a long time. What's going on? And he's basically pressuring Mark to join the group of their buddies at. Um, a bar where not very good things happen. And uh, Mark finally reluctantly has to let him know that uh, I just don't want to do that anymore. And then Jim uh, finally emails, concludes by saying, Mark, I know you. I know where you've been. I know what you've done. You and I both know that what you're trying to do is not going to last. Let me know when you're ready to call me again. Okay, so Jim becomes the vehicle of the enemy placing obstacles in the way. And Mark is pretty discouraged by this because, well, there's some truth uh, to what Jim says. That's where he's been and where he's trying to be now is not very affirmed. Okay, so he's pretty discouraged um, as this is going on. So this is where you get these voices. So the, any husband or wife who really wants to be holy in that vocation looks at saints like the parents of St. Therese and others and and says, I really want to live this vocation as a call to holiness. But then here's these voices, you know, that we've described. Um, you know yourself, you're too weak, don't ever get your hopes up on all of this. Now, if Mark believes these, these stirrings, these discouraging lies of the enemy, um, chances are that this new life will dissipate and things can go back to where they were. But if with Ignatius help and a bit of courage, now in the story, we have him meeting every so often with a, a really good priest, a Father Reed, um, whom I've taken from a, a really wonderful priest that I knew. And um, and Father Reed is helping him. Uh, he's kind of the vehicle of this classic uh, spiritual wisdom, you know, to Jim. And he helps him see the lies of the enemies here. So that's the rule 13. Don't be alone. And you know, this is a parenthesis, but uh, as I work with people in all vocations, husbands and wives have a way of being accompanied that's not there in any other vocation. Because you said being accompanied, being accompanied spiritually, yeah, that is not there in any other vocation, and that is um, their marriage partner right in the house with them. Uh, if they can be walking this journey together, very beautiful things happen. And as this story unfolds, as we get maybe halfway through the book, uh, Mark finally discovers this. He's been trying to do this. He's embarrassed by his struggles, trying to do it on his own. And finally, he realizes a point comes when finally, and this weighs on Anne. She knows he's suffering, but he, he's not sharing it with her. And finally, a point comes when he, uh, one evening, um, at this point, they have children and 
the children are, uh, you know, a bed for the night. And he says, Anne, can we talk? And she knows what he means. And this is a turning point because now uh, he realizes that his greatest help all the time was right there in the house with him. And they begin to share this together. Some of the most beautiful things that have been said to me about the book we're discussing, I'll just quote one of them. Um, a wife who wrote me and she said that my husband and I are going through this book together and we're now talking on a level that we've never talked on before in our marriage because now they have a vocabulary for this kind of experience and they have it together. And, you know, one, um, one husband told me that he and his wife who have both gone through this together, um, they have a pact that if one of them is in spiritual desolation, discouraged and struggling, he or she will text the other who texts back, I'm praying with you, I'm with you. So that they're never alone, you know, as uh, as they go through these things. Okay, so that's the kind of struggle that will be there when we're trying to go forward. Maybe another one too. So maybe at a certain point, Jim finds himself, um, this is Mark, finds himself thinking, um, you know what? You don't want to admit this, but you know what all this spiritual stuff is really about? Uh, you're in competition with your wife. Um, and you know what else? This you'll never admit. But you know that your in-laws never thought that you were really enough of a Catholic for their for their daughter, and you just want to look better in their eyes, and so forth. Okay, this is what Ignatius calls the enemy disquieting with false reasons. So all of these tactics are normal. There's no shame in experiencing them. There's no surprise that we experience them. We all do. But what matters is to be aware of them, uh, be able to identify them for the lies of the enemy that they are, and firmly reject them. Because okay, I, Can I, I interrupt, Father? Because most sure. of the time, I think what we've always used in the common vernacular is my self-talk right? That's what the modernist and everyone says, your self-talk. But from what I'm hearing you say, it's not necessarily self speaking, but those spirits, you know, the angel and the devil, right? That are really whispering things to you. And this, this book is about discerning those spirits. Why are you inclined to listen to the negative voice? Or why are you more inclined to listen to the positive voice, the angel versus the devil? Or if you're not inclined just knowing how to discern which one's good and maybe your your wife's voice or your husband's voice to to strengthen that so is, is that i mean that seems really simple that it's not really self-talk that we're having as much we do have that as these spirits that are trying to get us do what's wrong or do what's right is that oversimplified that's right Absolutely on target. And this is the huge contribution that Ignatius's 14 rules make, I think, uh, in, a, in a more effective way than anything else in 2000 years of our Catholic spiritual tradition. And that is to recognize that our interior experience, some of which takes place in our thoughts and some of which takes place in our hearts, that there are three actors in that. Uh, we, we tend to, uh, if, if you simply look at things on the natural psychological level, thank God for counselors and psychologists because the healing and help that can bring on the natural level is, is, a, is a great service. But there is a deeper level of our experience that um, we may not even recognize. So yes, Ignatius says, I um, there are three thoughts within me. One is from my own, my own thinking, my own feeling. But there is also the the voice of the good spirit and the enemy. And once we begin to realize that, you know, the way I would say it is, it's as though someone were to say to a person who doesn't know the game of baseball, but maybe has occasionally seen a little bit on television or, uh, you know, go on out there and play center field. <laughs> okay. But the person doesn't know the rules. It's very different when you sit down with the person, explain the rules, and then say, okay, now go out into the arena. And that's what Ignatius does. What always happens when people learn these rules is they'll always say the same thing. Everybody should know this. Because once you know, call it the rules, um, call it the, the the playing field and the actors, then you know how to identify what's going on and you know how to respond to it. I'll just give one example. Are you talking when, the gifts of the spirit, like asking for knowledge or wisdom or discernment? Is that... Or is that the fruit of the spirit? That's a gift, right? 
That's the gifts of the spirit. That's and that's basically a- what we're asking is that if you know these rules, the Lord is blessing you with this gift of the spirit towards discernment. So you start with the knowledge, then you have discernment. And of course, wisdom, ultimately, that's what I'm hearing as you're going through this is sure. this book isn't just a book that's going to help your marriage and help you know the good spirit, the bad spirit. But then ultimately, it's saying you're being fed in the way that God asks you to be fed. The fruit of the spirit are things you'll get when you practice things. The gifts of the spirit are things that you're gaining. I don't know. That's what I'm hearing from this going. This is a good practice, which will bless you in more ways than just your marriage. Oh, oh, that's why I said earlier that this is universal. There is no person in any vocation who does not need these rules because that every one of us is experiencing everything that Ignatius talks about. Again, as I said earlier, he's not adding anything to the spiritual life. He's just, but just explaining to us for most of us for the first time what's been going on all along. And we didn't know what it was. And so we didn't know what to do about it. Yeah, there's an overlap there. Uh, certainly, uh, Ignatius or the Spirit's gift of counsel is certainly going to be at play in this. There are really two ways to learn this wisdom about discernment. One is, and this is usually exceptionally holy people, think of a Mother Teresa and so forth, or a John Paul II, by, by the gift of the Holy Spirit. The more common way to learn this is by letting our formation, our spiritual tradition teach us, that is formation in discernment. And if I may mention my own books and podcasts and so on, I've tried to contribute to that, you know, uh, for people. But let me get back to it. Just I'll just give this one example. So I had gone through these rules once with a group of people. And one woman contacted me later. And she said to me, for years in my spiritual life, I've been hearing this voice. You're not what God wants you to be. You know, you should be up here, but you're down here and you you fritter away time. You're impatient. You're not loving in the way that you should be. Your prayer is not all that it should be. Uh, you struggle with temptations in, in various ways. You're not what God wants you to be. And she said, I thought that that was God's voice. Mm. But to realize that, no, that's the enemy's voice. And it's a lie. And that I'm called to reject that, she said, changed everything for me in the spiritual life. And you can see, Christine, why as I give examples like this, why why basically I'm dedicating my life now to writing and speaking about this because it can make that kind of difference. And, you know, it's, I'd say it's even more important today because the culture around us, um, much less than in Ignatius' time, supports a life of faith. And so it becomes more and more important that from within we have this formation uh, so that we can live on this spiritual level, which sets us free. Well, I bet, I mean, I would love to be a fly on the wall, you know, when you're literally with couples or even not with couples, but you know, what a gift it is that the Lord kind of brought you to this place. I mean, I've talked to a lot of priests and it's wonderful to see where God kind of pushes them. And so this discernment of spirits that just well 27 books and these last several books are all going in this direction seem like it's your vocation in a vocation at least for this season yeah no well it was never something that i planned uh what happened was i had a conversation with a uh, one of my classmates actually a few years after ordination and he'd been working with some jesuits and had kind of gotten into these rules for discernment and as I listened to him, something in me said, you know, I guess there's more there than I knew, and I, I really need to learn it. And so I started uh, formally studying it, you know, going through commentaries, um, working in depth on this. And I'll never forget, the, uh, it might have been the first time, actually, that I ever spoke about it. It was a small group of people and uh, an eight-day retreat. And over the course of the retreat, every day I would give a little half-hour talk taking them through these rules. And what happened was electric. Uh, The people knew and I knew that in the transmitting and receiving of these rules, something really important had happened. So much so that the organizers of these retreats uh, started asking me to do two, and then it became three of these retreats. uh, About 11 years that I did that. And then eventually um, I was asked to do this as part of a a training program for spiritual directors. And finally, 
my uh, provincial superior asked me to make a book out of this, which I'd never thought of doing. He had to say it three times before it finally sunk in that I think maybe the Lord is saying I something here. This. Yeah. And uh, since then, what the, what has driven all of it is that people can't get enough of this once they learn it. Uh, they say, I wish I'd known this 20, 30 years ago, which I love hearing, by the way, because what that means is they're really getting it now. Yes. That's when you really learn it, when you start to see it in your own experience. Uh, and then you realize another time when I'm in that situation, it can go differently. So that's what's really driven the whole thing and uh, continues to today. Mm. Okay, Father, not a question, kind of a fill in the blank, um, taking all of this life's work that you've had and um, really applying it to your own life. I have a fill in the blank for you. And it's this, when I die, I will know my life has been a success if. I would say if I've been a faithful religious and priest to the end of my life, if I have been faithful to the three vows of poverty and chastity and obedience that I've taken. And if I have been able to serve another, at least one person, please God more, and help them to feel stronger, bring them to greater clarity and greater joy in living their spiritual life and therefore their vocation, then my life will have been worthwhile. I've never forgotten one of my professors, uh, a wonderful Dominican, when I was doing theology, saying to us, we contribute our grain of sand and then pass on. And I've always loved that saying because I can't change the world, but I can contribute my grain of sand. So if I've done that faithfully before the Lord calls me, then my life will have been worth living. Mm, that's beautiful. My mom said to me when I was younger, I always wanted to change the world. And the Lord said to me, just sa or save the world. She said, just save your own little slice. <laughs> you know, it's a good analogy. Same thing, your grain of sand, because actually in the, in the scheme of the trillions of humans that have existed, we are but a grain of sand in that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have one more, and this is actually in the vein of what you do in your books and what we've been doing here. I never like people to leave going, oh, that was a great show. And then not gaining. So let's give them something actionable. Name one thing you'd have our listeners do differently as a result of something they heard today. You gave them a lot. One thing they should do differently. Can I say two? Okay, fine. We'll do two. <laughs> All right. Number one, don't make changes in desolation. And number two, if you have found what we've talked about at all of interest or useful, uh, forgive me if I mention my own book, but read the book. And I don't think you'll be disappointed if you do. And especially if you can read it together as husband and wife. Yes. And I want to second that is get father's book. I think it's written 27. I was so um, embarrassed to think that it had only been seven but the one that we are talking about today discernments of spirits in marriage ignatian wisdom for husbands and wives guys you haven't when people say to me i've done everything i'm ready to give up on the marriage you haven't unless you've read all the books unless you've talked to all the counselors mm -hmm. unless you've done everything with god's grace you can always find that specific thing that you need so i would love for you guys to get your hands on this book so um, how can they get this book, Father? I know they can go to sophiainstitute.com, right? Sure. And of course, I have a website, which is just FR for Father, frtimothygallagher.org. But any Google search for my name will pull that right up and everything's available there. But it's available anywhere books are available through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or anywhere books are available. This is This is, can be found. But I like the idea of going to your website because, you know, as you were speaking, this is kind of like the vocation, or at least for the season, God has been pulling you. So the the, the book, another book that you were doing is just Discernment of Spirits. Um, oh, what's the other one we were going to talk about, Father? Uh, struggles in the spiritual life, that's their nature is. and their remedies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's not even specific to marriage. So Go to Father's website, frgallagher.org. Timothygallagher.org. Timothy I messed it up. frtimothygallagher.org. Yes. Take a look at all the books that he's written. And 
maybe one of them is the one that the Lord's calling you to read at this time. So <clears throat> if you heard a lot of information today, go ahead and send this show to somebody that you think might benefit from it. A lot of times I'll have parents come to me and say, I, I want to save my kid's marriage. I'm sure father's heard that a million times as well. Yeah. Sometimes you just take this book, hand it to them, or maybe forward them the video. Go to my website, breakfastwithbacon.com, and you will find I've had amazing guests, other authors, other priests. People have talked about really difficult topics. They say to me often, geez, Christine, you say the things that I was thinking, but I was too embarrassed to say out loud. Mm -hmm. Go, go, let us, let me and my guests do that for you. So forward this show on, please go and subscribe to all my pages, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, God has been doing amazing things with the people he's sending me like Father Gallagher. And I would love for you to be one of them. Subscribe to my newsletter. I'll let you know um, if I'll be in your area speaking and things like that. Oh, and get my book, The Super Couple, A Formula for Extreme Happiness and Marriage. I interviewed extremely happily married couples to discover if extreme happiness was accidental or was it a formula? I found that formula. It was amazing. S-A-C-R-E-D, sacred. And that formula saved my own marriage. And my husband and I are going to have 40 years of marriage next year. Praise God. So mm, congratulations. Um, thank you, Father. I appreciate that. But we have to go off the air. So for all of you watching, I am so grateful. Again, go to Father's website, frtimothygallagher.org look him up, find him. You can find him on Facebook as well. And what is that? Father Timothy Gallagher on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then breakfastwithbacon.com. Father, I'm going to see if I can give you telepathically. Remember how we end my shows. You forget it's okay. <laughs> but to all of you, I'd love to thank you for watching. I am Dr. Christine Bacon. You have been watching Breakfast with Bacon. And I'd sunny. like to remind you always to live your life. Sunny side up. Yes. <laughs>